will be recorded, which I'm starting now. But having said that, feel free to ask me questions at any time. So uh, whenever you want to ask a question, you can just uh, post it in the chat. I can see the chat here. Um, so I can address it there. Or you can just unmute yourself and start talking. So I really do um, encourage questions. So we have a one hour session ahead of us today. Um, and first, I'll give some overview of the course and some of the housekeeping details uh, when the lectures and seminars are and so on. I'll introduce myself and then talk a bit about my background. Uh, then we'll go over what we're going to do in the course. We'll look at the whole syllabus and we'll do sort of an example overview lecture. So we'll see uh, what a, a, a lecture from the course would look like. So throughout this, um, I do encourage you to ask uh, any questions you would like. So please go ahead. Um, and uh, if you don't want to appear on the recording, you can just uh, do that in the chat. Okay, so this is a production of MindShop. So MindShop is a knowledge society. And uh, what we mean by that is we try to spread the knowledge that we have as uh, scientists or as researchers because it should be accessible to everyone. It's often said that you can't really say that you understand something um, unless you can explain it to, to anyone. So it's all about sharing knowledge, building up uh, skills, testing out our knowledge by having discussion groups and uh, doing some essays and so on, um, and just answering some of the uh, big questions that challenge us about science. Um, by the way, I can see uh, that I'm I'm coming through the microphone, but do let me know if it's either uh, too loud or too quiet. I can adjust that. Uh, let me know if your, your um, microphone is is right, Pintan. Nice meeting it's, you. It's it's okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's it's just that there's another person that uh, they have their microphone on as well. Oh, uh, right. You can so mute them. Yeah, we'll just um, we'll just mute them um, quickly. One one second. I think it's Camilo. Who's, uh, who's my yeah, uh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, um, moving on. So this is uh, week zero for the course. Um, so the the week before we start, and um, zero uh, comes from a computer science tradition that we start counting from zero because uh, the the maths are a bit easier. So this is before week one. Um, when we get started with the course, this is what it will look like. So this is group C1, the inaugural uh, group for this course. Our email address is mindshop.loveless, named after Ada Loveless, who's widely regarded as actually the first computer programmer um, back in, in uh, 1830, which is quite a long time ago. So all our lectures will be at this time on uh, Wednesdays, so 6.30 p.m. Mexico City time. Um, that'll be true every week. We will have a break over the Christmas and New Year holidays. We'll have a two-week break. We, we'll also have some discussion seminars, which will take place on Saturdays. So the time is yet to be confirmed, but they'll they'll take place on Saturdays. Um, and in the discussion seminars, uh, we will they they won't be recorded. So we'll get the chance to ask any questions we may have. I will. Uh, ask some questions to the group as well and we'll be able to fully uh, discuss any queries or any anything that's unclear uh, we also have a whatsapp group uh, so just as in the other mind shop courses the philosophy courses that i know some of you have participated in so far we'll have a, a whatsapp group um, in which you can ask me questions so i'll be present in there and we'll also have Matthias, and uh, we'll have uh, Miriam as well to do any uh, questions that you may have. Um, all the lecture recordings will be available on Google Drive, so you'll be able to see those after the lecture, uh, but the discussion 
groups uh, won't be recorded. This is Miriam's number. Miriam's being uh, very kind to help us with administration. So if you add Miriam's number, of course, we'll send it out later as well. Then uh, she'll assist you with the next steps and you can ask her any questions that you may have as well. So what's coming up in this session? We'll talk a bit about the MindShop vision. So what MindShop's been trying to do and how this course is a part of it. Um, and we'll give an introduction to this course, Cognitive Science. We'll talk about everything you get if you uh, sign up for the course, uh, the structure, what the lectures and seminars will look like. And then for the last half an hour or so, we'll uh, do a sample lecture. So we'll see what a standard lecture from the course would usually look like. And of course, you can um, ask any questions that you may have. We won't do any discussion today, but do feel free to interrupt me. I'm looking at the chat so I can see anything you post in the chat. And you can also just uh, unmute yourself and start talking if you like. So MindShop is all about collaborative learning. And uh, we think that seeing and understanding different perspectives seeing what different questions people ask and seeing people's different life experience and how that contributes to their research is very important. So when we start the course um, in week one, I'll be asking everyone just to post in the chat a bit, what, a bit about their professions and so on. We, we won't do that today, but we would like once we start the course to, to get to know everyone and see uh, what you've read or thought about cognitive science before or psychology or any of any of the other brain sciences and uh, where you're all from and what your perspectives are so we will try to get to know each other a bit more as we start the course hi i'm finton nagel i'm a cognitive scientist i'm london based so i'm speaking to you from london at the moment and uh, that's where i've conducted most of my research so far as well. So I did my PhD here at UCL. I looked at motion perception and the perception of flames in natural scenes. So one of the things we asked was, why why do people uh, find it so interesting to look at flames and fire? Uh, we concluded it was because there are many short visual features that pop up and engage your attention for, say, half a second or so, and then they, they go away again. So you, you're... Uh, immediately showed another visual feature and you're very interested by it. This happens a lot in natural scenes. People like to look at flames. They also like to look at things like moving leaves and water. And this is one of the questions that we can address with cognitive science. We can ask, why do people find certain things uh, beautiful or salient or, or nice to look at? Uh, why do people like, for example, fractal patterns? Uh, why do people like certain combinations of color? And cognitive science will tell us that part of the answer is because uh, our natural environment, the environment we evolved in, had certain properties. And of course, we evolved to kind of match or to better understand these properties. So this is a common theme that we'll be touching on. Why are our brains and our minds uh, the way they are? Um, as you can hear, our lectures will be in English. Our discussion seminars will be in English as well. However, you can post questions in, in Spanish. I have kind of a, a working understanding knowledge of, of Spanish. So, of course, the answers will be in, in English, but feel free to post questions in Spanish uh, if you like. So the Mind Shop vision is to help everyone prepare or start or think about continuing education. And there are many initiatives like this. In, in the UK, for example, uh, we have an initiative that brings together uh, students from different universities and invites them all to Windsor Castle every year so they can all uh, get to know each other outside, um, outside the normal education system, so away from um, professors and, and so on. And the idea is that we can form independently our own ideas. So MindShop is all about sharing knowledge and uh, doing so in a robust way and a way that doesn't, uh, that's not constrained by any particular ideology. So this is a quote that Matthias always uses to uh, present the mind shop idea. The mere, the mere repetition of any past experiences, even to infinity, never will arise any new original idea. 
In order to arise new ideas, we must create new experiences. We must weave our thoughts together. So this is a quote from philosophy. And uh, there is a huge crossover between philosophy and cognitive science because they both ask, why do we see the world the way that we do? They both ask, are there any different ways that we could see the world? Um, yes, so Mateus has uh, included this quote before in Spanish. I think it's it's a pretty nice sounding quote in Spanish as well. Um, and it, it also relates to, to creativity, which is also something that we study in cognitive science. Why do we, how do we come up with new ideas? Why did it take us so long? Cognitive science sometimes studies itself. So it asks, why didn't we discover these things before? Why has it taken us um, this long to, to get to this, to get to where we are now? And of course, we have a very long way to go as well. So another big idea will be that uh, we're very far from completely understanding the brain. We're very far from actually having any satisfactory sort of explanation for how the brain works. And we're still discovering completely new things all the time that are completely shocking and unexpected. We only discovered a couple of years ago, for example, that uh, when you, you're sleeping, channels in the brain open up to drain out toxins which accumulate. So that's uh, why you start to feel tight in the head after, say, 24 hours without sleep. Um, so we're still discovering completely new things all all the time. Uh, Mindshop has a, a pretty long history. So Matthias and I began to collaborate on Mindshop uh, back in 2014 uh, to 2015 when uh, Matthias was in, in London. So we did some uh, brain science events over in London. Uh, Matthias has been back several times to work on his his studies and his research there. And I'm very happy to be on board as the lecturer for this, our first English model uh, module and our first brain science module as well. So welcome everyone. Um, I hope uh, you're okay with the, the English language. I hope that's not a surprise to anyone uh, arriving today. I would try to uh, do the course in Spanish, but uh, I think uh, we wouldn't have as good a time. But of course, the questions, I'm happy to to take those um, in Spanish. Thank you. So this is our uh, syllabus. So this is one of the things you will get uh, as soon as you sign up to the course. Um, we'll look today at what all the, the lectures will be as well, what the, the 10 topics will be. So a bit of housekeeping, a bit of general administration. Um, we'll have 10 lectures and 10 seminars. So this is actually over uh, 13 weeks because we have week zero as well. And there are two weeks off for uh, Christmas. So the Christmas and New Year weeks, uh, we won't have any lectures or seminars then. Uh, the lectures are all at this time on Wednesdays. They will be 90 minutes. So they will be um, one hour lecturing from me with uh, slides and so on and uh, various interesting images. We'll look at some research papers, we'll look at brain scans and so on. And then we'll have a half an hour discussion session uh, after that during which you can ask any questions that you may have. Um, so these are the topics of the 10 lectures starting with next week we'll have uh, week one. And of course feel free to put your hand up if you want me to clarify anything or go over it again. Week one will be sort of an overview lecture. We'll ask, what is cognitive science? Where does it come from? Why is it one of the most exciting sciences in, in research today? Um, it's a very exciting time for brain sciences. For physics, for example, the exciting times were in the 1920s and 1930s when we, we came up with relativity and nuclear physics and quantum physics and so on. But the exciting times for cognitive science that starting now, we're mm -hmm. really starting to get the tools exactly. that we need to understand how the brain might support consciousness and perception and so on. One of the main characteristics of cognitive science is that it brings together lots of different disciplines. So before we really get started, we'll spend a week looking at language and mathematics. So we won't actually be doing any mathematics uh, on this course. We won't, we won't have to manipulate any equations and so on. Um, one of the, the reasons that I chose to go into um, computer science 
uh, brain science or cognitive science originally <laughs> is that I thought I would prefer to uh, avoid maths. So we won't actually be uh, doing any maths, but we will be uh, consuming it as uh, as sort of fans. We will be looking at what maths can do. We'll be asking how how did it take so long? Why did it take, for example, hundreds of years for us to accept that zero was a good idea? Why did we spend a long time uh, banning zero and uh, not doing calculations in the most efficient way? In week three, we'll start to look at the brain and our story with the brain will actually start with ancient Egypt and ancient Rome because we've spent a very long time trying to understand the brain. And in fact, the ancient Egyptians knew quite a lot that was correct. For about 400 years after that, the Romans and the early church fathers and other um, researchers in the Dark Ages, they had a lot of misconceptions about the brain. They had a lot of bad ideas. Um, some even thought that the brain didn't do any cognition at all, and it was just for cooling. So we had about 500 years of terrible misconceptions about the brain. Um, in week four, we'll step away from the brain and look at computation. So one of the fashionable ideas these days is that the brain could be a bit like a computer. And it's not really a new thing that whenever humans come up with a new technology, uh, they immediately say, well, the brain might be like this. It happened with steam and hydraulics. It happened with electricity. Um, and it's happening with computers as well. So to to ask if the brain is a computer or not, we have to really understand what a computer is. And on this course, of course, we won't do any programming either, but we'll explore computation and see what it can do. And there are some fascinating questions here. What problems can you solve? There are some problems that you can prove that you can't solve. Uh, can we answer all possible questions in, in a formal system, in a theory, or are there some questions that a particular theory can't ask? And uh, what are the paradoxes that can kill a theory or that can cause it to crash? And uh, it's been a common idea that there might be uh, ideas which can crash the, the brain as well, and they, they haven't um, showed up yet. So why, why is the brain so robust? Uh, why is it why does the brain resist crashing and failing in, in a way that computers just, just can't? After looking at computation, we'll come back to the brain with the tools of computation in hand. So we'll look at brain scanning, new technologies like EEG, electroencephalographic uh, imaging, and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which allow us to look inside the brain in ways that we couldn't before and to look not just at its anatomy, but also at its function. So what different areas of the brain do? Um, how do we find out which areas of the brain do what? And is that the whole story? If we found a brain area that seems to have something to do with face perception, can we say that it just does face perception? Or does it just sort of participate in a, a big group discussion in the brain about face perception? So we look at the story of the discovery of things like the visual cortex. How do we know which parts of the brain do vision and the face perception area? In week six, we'll follow on the thread of computation and we'll look at artificial intelligence or AI, which is, of course, a very big topic uh, now. In the past few months, I've, I've met people who are writing uh, their job application letters using chat GPT. I even have a colleague who's writing reference letters for his students using chat GPT. So artificial intelligence is, is everywhere. We have to deal with it. It could be rather harmful for society. It has the potential to be that way, but it also has the potential to be very useful for brain science. It can do things like decode what's happening in, in someone's mind. It can do things like predict um, not very accurately, but predict or try to predict what people are going to do next. With AI in mind, we'll go back to the brain again, and we'll ask, with these tools of artificial intelligence and machine learning, how can we understand the brain further? So how can we do things like 
like uh, put someone in an MRI machine, record lots of brain imaging data from them and try and work out what they're thinking about. And this is actually possible now. Uh, we look at a paper actually from 2011 where uh, they started to make inroads in, in this uh, challenge. And we'll see that over the last couple of years, people are using deep learning, the same thing that produces all this AI art and uh, that produces ChatGPT to uh, decode what's happening in the brain. So what people are, for example, dreaming about. And these are really um, astonishing experiments. We, we wouldn't have thought, say, 20 years ago that you'd be able to uh, read out the topic or the uh, the thing that someone was dreaming about or reconstruct a video of what they're seeing. So AI allows us to model the brain and to create uh, predictive models of it to help us understand the brain and the mind. So after week seven, we really have all the ingredients that we need to form a complete picture of cognitive science and to think about uh, what people are working on these days in the field. So we'll look at three research areas, perception, principally vision and hearing. Um, and we'll look at some current issues in cognitive science, especially some debates that a lot of people are actually arguing about, a lot of researchers are, are arguing about. And we'll see what could happen in the future of cognitive science. Can we ever understand the mind? How far can we predict things? Could we do anything like mind uploading? We'll also have 10 seminars on the weekends, on Saturdays, during which we'll discuss these important questions. So that will be both um, you guys participating and me leading the discussion and, and asking some uh, further questions. So when you sign up to the course, you'll receive a welcome letter for me, a code of conduct from Matthias, an overview introduction to cognitive science document, and the syllabus that we've seen earlier. You'll get the links for all the lectures and tutorials, and you'll get the Google Drive with the first five weeks of readings. So we have several um, PDFs for you to read each week. And we have a few more that constitute additional reading if you want to go further. And you'll receive the WhatsApp group link. Um, I will be in the WhatsApp group, so you'll be able to ask me questions there as well between the lectures or suggest uh, topics that you, you want to discuss. Um, so we've uh, given an overview of the, the 10 lectures so far. Uh, we'll look at the field as a whole. We'll look at language and mathematics. We'll start looking at the first, say, 800 years of uh, brain science and see how wrong it was. We'll see what computers are, what they do, and how it's different from the brain. Principally, the brain evolved itself and computers were designed by people. So we can understand computers because someone designed them. If something was designed, then there is a plan somewhere, but the brain might not have a plan because it wasn't designed. In lecture five, we'll look at brain imaging. Uh, we'll continue the computation thread with AI, brain modeling and machine learning. We'll look at perception. This is a painting by Turner. So visual artists are of course sort of vision scientists as well because vision scientists like myself study how uh, the brain sees things and artists study how to make the brain see things and we'll look at some uh, current issues and the future of cognitive science now every week um, and some of you will be familiar with this before if you've done a uh, Good question. There isn't a particular textbook. Um, I do have a big reading list with uh, lots of cognitive science textbooks that you can take a look at. And you can find most of them available free for download in various places online. So there isn't a particular textbook, um, but there are uh, five or six textbooks in the reading list that you can take your pick from. And uh, they're, they're all pretty good. Uh, good question. And go ahead, everyone else, if there's anything you'd, you'd like to ask, you can just... Uh, pop it in the chat. Okay, so the, the Nietzschean sky uh, system, so every every week we'll have a third of the class who rotates round and it will be your job to ask questions this week. Um, this is to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask questions and uh, no one feels put upon to, to ask, uh, ask a question every week, for example. So we'll, we'll rotate. Um, and here's another good philosophy quote, he who 
has much to proclaim one day, stays silently much immersed within himself. He who has to kindle the lightning one day must for a long time be a cloud. So Nietzsche is saying that uh, we should um, sometimes be quiet in order to let other people learn. So we will rotate uh, around our groups. At the end of each lecture, we'll have our discussion. So we'll have a 30 minute uh, round table. I'll ask some important questions. I'll, I'll challenge you to come up with some answers and you can challenge me to come up with some answers as well. Or you can ask me to go into more detail about anything that we're talking about. So this is the cone of experience. This is actually a result from cognitive science because cognitive science and psychology can ask, uh, how do we how do we learn? How does education work? What's the most efficient way to revise? And uh, this cone of experience tells us that we remember more the more engaged we get. I tend to make a lot of notes that perhaps I don't even go back and read later, but the the uh, act of writing something down, um, can help you remember it. We we certainly will review Neuralink. I'm very interested by by Neuralink. Um, I've uh, worked not 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 on a project like this, but I've worked with uh, researchers who do similar things to Neuralink. Um, someone, for example, implanted a small wireless chip in their arm, and their wife had one as well. So whenever uh, any of them, either of them, squeezed their hand, the other one could feel it. And this is only one kind of bit of information at a time, but uh, things like uh, systems that allow blind people to see again are getting better and better. At the moment, they're only a sort of 20 by 20 pixel grid. So you can see this blurry image, but they're getting better and better all the time. And Neuralink is a very interesting example. And of course, if, if you guys want to cover anything else, uh, feel free to request it. So starting halfway through the course, we'll have a chance to do some group presentations. Um, you can either go into your own groups or we'll randomly assign you. And you'll be able to, you, you can also work uh, by yourself if you prefer. And you'll have the opportunity to do a small presentation on a cognitive science topic of your choice, which we'll then review uh, in the last seminar. So that's what the course looks like overall. We have uh, 10 lectures nine discussion seminars. The 10th seminar is the group presentation. And if you'd like to receive also a diploma, you can do the final essay and get some comments from, from me. It's not, of course, a, a pass or fail thing. I'll just give you some some comments uh, on how you could perhaps improve or, or what, was, what was good about your essay. Um, as you know, if you've worked with Matthias before, there are plenty of other mind shop courses available. I believe Matthias is in another session doing one right now. Um, so feel free to explore those and they are all in Spanish as well. So Matthias is starting new courses uh, all the time. And we may have some philosophy courses in, in English eventually as well, but that's not my area. So this is the kind of diploma that... Uh, you'll get when you complete the course and and do your essay. And you also get the other the other membership benefits of Mindshop. So the WhatsApp groups, the discussion groups, and the chance to talk to other mind, like-minded people who are also interested in learning and uh, sharing ideas. So that's what's included overall in the course, lectures, seminars, uh, all of the reading, all of the audio and visual recordings of all of the lectures, lifetime mind shop membership, and the final project. This is our group C1. And I'll just say a bit about uh, payment and prices. You can also contact Miriam if you have any more uh, questions about this. And then we'll we'll move on to the sample lecture. So we'll start the, the sample lecture uh, one. We'll do an overview of the rest of the course. So these are the full prices, but we have two um, rates of discount. So the, the first early bird rate uh, before the 28th of October, there's a 15% discount there. Um, and Miriam will send you all this information uh, later on. So don't worry about the details for now. There's also a second uh, tier of uh, discount after the 28th of October. So that's a, a slightly... A uh, smaller discount, but it's still uh, a discount. And there's a further discount if you're already 
a member of MindShop. Okay, so let's start with our overview lecture. We have 25 minutes left or so. We'll, we'll finish at half past in case anyone has any other uh, commitments, but feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, we'll go pretty quickly during the overview lecture because I want to show you examples of what we'll be doing during the rest of the course. So I may not stop to explain everything and we, we may go quite quickly, but bear in mind during the rest of the course, uh, we will have the opportunity to go over all this um, in a, a more thorough manner and, of course, to to ask questions and to uh, explore the uh, full ramifications of the topics in the discussion group. So let's uh, begin with the overview lecture. This is my kind of summary quote for the whole course. This is from Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. And I was in uh, the pub in Cambridge where they, they discovered DNA, where Crick and Watson discovered DNA um, about uh, last year with, with Matthias. And uh, someone actually, someone who'd taken a mind shop course actually recognized Matthias in, in the pub and came and said hello to us. So Crick said, there is no scientific study more vital to man than the study of his own brain. Our entire view of the universe depends on it. And Crick who passed away in 2004 at the age of 88, um, would have loved to see what cognitive science can, can do now. So what is cognitive science overall? It's our attempt to understand how we understand the world. It's similar to lots of other areas of brain science, and it's similar to lots of other sciences as well. But it's the only one whose main purpose is to ask, how does our mind work? How does how do the structures, the physical structures of the brain support the mind? And how does the mind construct the world that we feel? How does it support our conscious experience? <coughs> Cognitive science is connected to many fields, principally psychology and philosophy, but also linguistics, AI and neuroscience are used as tools and computing, of course. So cognitive science is a bit like the English language. It steals words and concepts from other fields, just as English borrows words from other languages. And there are more fields that it connects with, all of these. Um, the difference between cognitive science and epistemology. So as I understand it, epistemology is, is, is very much a topic in philosophy. So epistemology is the it's a part of philosophy. And it's the study of how uh, knowledge is organized. It's often compared with ontology, which is the study of existence. Um, I'm not a philosopher, though, so Matthias will will know more about this. And uh, by the way, Matthias will be sending out a short video uh, concerning his, his view on this course. You'll get that tomorrow, so feel free to watch uh, Matthias's view as well. Um, so epistemology isn't really part of brain science. It's part of philosophy. And all these other areas that we can see on the screen now are related to cognitive science too. And these are the mental processes that cognitive science studies. So these are the processes that we're trying to understand from problem solving to how we, we reach for things and uh, how we move around the world. Cognitive science is the opposite of behaviorism. Behaviorism was perhaps the, the leading uh, movement or worldview in psychology for most of the early 20th century. And they thought because they didn't have any brain imaging, that it was best to treat the brain as a black box and only study behavior. And this led to lots of rather cruel experiments with rats and mice and so on, uh, which didn't really teach us that much about how their brains worked. So behaviorism says we can't really look inside the mind. Cognitive science says we can. We've got to open the box and try and find out what's going on. Both physically, what's the actual machinery of the mind like? And also um, conceptually, how does it how does it work on a kind of ideas level? And can we simulate the mind in another machine that isn't the brain? Can we simulate the mind in something like a computer? Cognitive science is linked uh, intimately with philosophy, so we'll go over all these philosophical positions and we'll see what they mean in terms of brain science. Uh, can we consider that 
objects like this remote control are actually independently real or are they only real because our brain constructs them? And we'll ask a lot of big questions. So how does my brain work? Why does it go wrong? Why do I forget things? Why cannot I not remember everything? Where does my brain come from? How, how did it form? Were the brains of early, early men or early humans similar to ours or, or were they different? Uh, do other people's brains work differently than ours and how? How do we explain individual differences? We're not too bothered about other people's brains. It's other people's minds that we're interested in. And how does consciousness work? <clears throat> How does the brain build conscious experience for us? Can computers be conscious? What does it mean to be conscious? Those are the big questions that the, the person on the street asks. And researchers don't really ask these questions yet because we're not quite ready to answer them. So we can go a long way towards answering them, but we can't get a full answer yet. Um, so we also ask some more restricted questions in uh, research. So this is a quick demonstration of uh, what it means to to be a researcher. And we, we have to be very um, kind of modest as researchers. The further we go into research, really, the more we know about what we don't know. Imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge. When you finish uh, elementary school, when you say 10 years old, you know a little bit. And you know the same little bit as everyone else does. You know the same stories and the same words as everyone else does. High school adds another layer of knowledge, and then a bachelor's degree starts to specialize. So finally, you're learning something different than other people, and you're, you're pushing off in a particular other way from the center of the circle. A master's degree makes that even more special. And reading research papers takes you all the way to the edge of human knowledge. Then you push on the edge for a few years and focus on it and really zoom in. So you, you only know this little area now. And eventually you make a small dent in the boundary and that's called a PhD. So the research project that you do to get your qualification as a, as a PhD, which is what you need to go ahead and, and do research. So this qualification takes about three, three or four years in Europe, maybe five or six years in America. And you really focus on a particular topic. Mine was the motion of natural scenes and how do we perceive that? Now your world is very zoomed in and you've made a small dent in the sum of human knowledge. So there's, there's a lot going on. We can't ask everything. We're going to start at the beginning. So this is all the way back to uh, about 3000 years ago, Egyptian times. And uh, we'll start by analyzing an old papyrus, which gives actually neurosurgical instructions from Egyptian times. And we'll see that they, they actually had a pretty good description of what was going on and how you should treat these things. The Romans, on the other hand, got a lot wrong. They thought that the most important structures in the brain were these structures that you can see rotating here in blue. These are the ventricles. Because if you just sort of cut the brain open, these are the biggest structures that pop out at you. You don't see neurons or cells or anything like that because they're all too small. We know now that the ventricles are just basically liquid-filled shock absorbers. They don't do anything to do with cognition. So the Romans were a bit wrong there. Um, one of the first people to be right was Willis. So he was a European. He worked in London. He was actually also an, uh, an architect. So he designed uh, some important buildings in London and he noted that the cerebellum or the, the little brain which you can see here in red looks more or less the same in humans as it does in animals and he inferred it had some basic functions to do with breathing moving around all the things that we can do and animals can also do so he was right there uh, that turned out to be correct um we'll look at the discovery of neurons so moving into the 19th century this is a drawing by ramon e cajal of the hippocampus the memory area of the brain and we'll see that one of the next big discoveries was neurons the brain's made of billions 80 billion or 100 billion or so 
neurons, which are all joined together. And this is a real electron micrograph of real neurons in someone's actual brain. So you can see how densely they're connected to each other. You can see how complex this is. And there are, of course, billions of these. It's the same number of neurons we have in the brain as there are stars in the galaxy, 100 billion. So that's incredibly complex. That's more complex than a city. That's more complex than the electronic circuitry uh, in a computer. Uh, we'll look at the structure of individual neurons. We'll see how they conduct information, how they transfer information. We'll look at the connections between two neurons, synapses, uh, where the information is not transferred electronically like it is in the neuron. It crosses the synapse by means of chemicals. So this is where we can use um, other chemicals to alter the effects of the synapses in medication. <coughs> we'll see some famous patients. Um, discoveries in brain science and cognitive science often come from famous patients. This is Phineas Gage. He suffered a serious head injury, after which he lived more or less happily for another 40 years. So that showed that the areas of the brain that were damaged in, in Phineas Gage uh, weren't really necessary for staying alive. He did become a bit grumpy after that, though, so they're, they're necessary for things like getting on well with your friends and neighbors. We'll return again and again to neuroanatomy, the structure of the brain or the anatomy of the brain. So we can see here the four lobes of the brain. We'll look at neuroanatomy in, in quite a lot of detail. The temporal lobe is called so not because it processes time, but because it's the, the area of the head where you get your gray hair as time goes on. So it's the, the, the old man's gray hair lobe. And there are lots of similar stories about uh, how different parts of the brain got their, their names. And we can see here, so that the front um, is on the left, the occipital lobe is at the back, so that's on the right. And we can see the uh, limbic lobe in the middle. That's another part that's common to other animals. So it's a part that supports functions like basic emotions, hunger and thirst that we share with lots of other animals. We'll look at imaging techniques. This is EEG and this is MRI. This is the first MRI machine back in 1977. He came up with the idea for the MRI machine while he was having a burger. And this is what the MRI machine can do. So we can get both structural scans that show us just anatomically what's happening in the head. And we can get functional scans. So these, the colors on this scan are brain activity. They are neurons firing, information being processed, and thoughts happening. And we can see that there are some areas that if you look at pictures of faces while you're in the MRI scanner, they're activated more. And this is one of the ways that we can track down which areas are responsible for uh, processing faces. And we can discover very interesting things with fMRI. This is the default mode network. It's a, a network that takes over when you're not really doing anything else. So when you're not doing a particular task, the default mode network activates. And it does things like consolidate the memories that you have of today and think about what you're going to do tomorrow. One of the effects of mobile phones is that your default mode network doesn't really get to do much work because you spend so much time task-oriented scrolling through your mobile phone and not uh, just standing around daydreaming. So using research methods from psychology and cognitive science, we can show that daydreaming actually has a useful function in planning the future and consolidating memory. Um, this is the paper I mentioned, which uses fMRI to read out videos of what people are seeing. So we'll we'll look at the videos later on in the course. But if you look at the bottom of this figure, you can see the reconstructed movies and uh, you can also see the presented movies. So they're not exactly reconstructing what the person was seeing, but they're they're reasonably OK. This is definitely a person. And the shapes are more or less right. So we'll look further into this as we go on. <clears throat> Here's the paper here. It's actually from 2011. Uh, we will look at a lot of research papers in, in this way. We'll get them up on the screen and look at their figures. We'll see how to read a research paper. We'll see it's, it's a lot easier than it may appear. Um, most researchers read a paper or approach a paper just by reading the abstract, the, uh, the introduction at the beginning, and just by looking at all the figures. 
So there's often a lot of additional detail that you really don't need to read and you just need to skim the paper and look at the important conclusions. Researchers, of course, always try to big up their ideas and make them seem maybe more important than they are. Uh, we'll look at language. This is one of the, the very first uh, examples of written language. It's actually a bill. It says that someone owes someone um, some money for some wine. Um, and we'll see how linguistics progressed into the 70s. We'll see, of course, Noam Chomsky, who Matthias and I had the great privilege of being on a panel with once. Um, and we'll look at the linguistics wars, which is Chomsky's fight against these uh, more modern linguists uh, who eventually won on how grammar works and uh, how important the rules of grammar are. Linguistics is related to maths. Maths is kind of an upgraded form of language in that it can work stuff out on its own. Maths can help us to um, save and store our information, and it can help us to predict things. It can do basic predictions. Um, you can solve an equation, for example, and use that as a basic model. And this models very well physics, how, how things are thrown, um, how things move around. But we'll see that we need much more complicated equations to model the brain. And maths took quite a long time to, to get going. As I said, zero was banned for quite a long time. Um, we now have the tools to understand perception. So we'll spend a lot of time actually looking at visual perception because it's one of the, uh, the most important senses for us and one of the most compelling. So here you can see there's a, a purple background and your visual system is telling you that there's a blue there are some blue spirals and there are some green spirals. And I'm going to tell you that the blue spirals and the green spirals are actually the same color, which seems pretty impossible to believe. Um, but this is actually a very strong visual illusion and we can prove it by doing this. So you've got the green spiral on the right, the blue spiral on the left. And if you look in the middle, you can see that they're actually the same color. But if you don't attend to the middle, they still seem to be different colors. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll look, uh, at a lot of other visual illusions as well. Some of which, uh, work better than others. Some of which are very strong indeed. We'll try and explain visual processes like visual search. Here you can see that one of the T's really stands out immediately from the others because it's slanted. So why do certain properties pop out at us like this and make themselves immediately obvious? Well, certain other properties you have to search manually. You have to use your attention to search manually and look at each of the uh, the shapes to see if they, they match what you're searching for. We look at the anatomy of the eye and how this feeds into the visual system. Um, very early uh, results in vision showed us that it's really the percent change that matters. The, the two... Um, grids here on the bottom one goes from 10 dots to 110 dots the other goes from 20 to 120 so and they look sort of the same difference so it's proportions that matter and this was discovered quite a long time ago in the 19th century actually but it took us a long time to figure out more about the visual system in modern times we've been able to characterize it better um we'll spend a lot of time looking at um diagrams of the brain like this and saying which parts do what and mapping them in, say, a flow chart here on the right. We'll look at audition. Here's the anatomy of the ear. And here's the auditory center in the brain. This is actually pretty well understood. We have a frequency map. So there's a big area of cortical tissue in the brain that's laid out like a piano. It has the low frequencies at one side and the high frequencies at the other side. And it processes information that way. Attention is a very important process in cognitive science. It's also not very well understood. We all understand how to use our attention. If I ask you to, for example, attend to uh, the, the men in this picture or the women in this picture, you could attend to the people wearing red clothes or the people wearing <laughs> blue clothes. You can attend to the people wearing stripes. And if you attend to the right conjunction of features, then you can find Wally. We'll look at lots of experiments, famous experiments from cognitive science, which have uh, allowed us to discover these things. This is, for example, the Posner paradigm. Um, we'll go through it in more detail later, but uh, in short, 
early on in each trial, each trial lasts about five seconds or so, <clears throat> you're given an arrow that either points left or right, and that's telling you where the target probably is. Then your job is to look for the target, which will show up, and it might be where the arrow said it was, or it might not. So you can look at the situation where the target comes up in an unexpected situation and <clears throat> the situation where it's uh, where you expected it to be. And we'll eventually work up to understanding attention and its relationship to consciousness. So how do conscious experiences get built? How do the, the neural signals that are coming in from our eyes, which are still very simple, they're like what a camera would see, or uh, the signals coming in from our ears get built into these rich emotional experiences that form our daily lives. Do we have free will? This is the famous Libet experiment, uh, which can predict when someone is going to press a button using an EEG scan. So it, it knows that you're going to press the button before you have. And what are the consequences of this for free will? We'll look at how knowledge is built up, how uh, people learn about concepts, how they bring together uh, different concepts to form new things. And we'll see how AI tries to do this as well. ChatGPT doesn't. ChatGPT is just a, a black box. It doesn't really have any useful internal representations. It can't really explain itself. But future generations of AI may use concept networks like this, a bit like more like the brain does. And they may be a lot uh, nicer to talk to. They may seem a lot more intelligent and a lot more human than the uh, LLMs, large language models like ChatGPT that we have at the moment. How do our minds manage metaphor and analogy? How do they use um, metaphors to solve problems? We find it very easy to think about, for example, the um, uh, uh, someone who's debating as a warrior. So we can use these metaphors. I'm, I'm attacking someone with my arguments or I'm defending someone with my argument. We find this very easy. Machines and AI currently find this very hard. So this is something that we really specialize in, seeing correspondences and metaphors and uh, using humor and jokes and things like that, things that machines are very far from being able to do. Uh, mental imagery, this is an experiment where you have to Imagine walking around an island, and uh, the main result is that it takes you longer to imagine the more uh, you, the more distance you imagine. And this was quite surprising at the time. Uh, we'll look more at this later, of course. Um, in terms of computation, we'll ask what problems can be solved, which are which are more difficult, and does the brain solve problems at all like a computer? This is the traveling salesman problem on the right. You're, you're challenged with finding an efficient route between different cities, um, and the brain works very differently. We look at the first programmer, um, Ada Lovelace, who's given her name to our group, and the first, uh, the, the most famous early male programmer, Alan Turing, who asked in, in this paper, um, can a machine think? Can we tell the difference between a thinking machine and a person? And we look at some other models of the brain, models of individual neurons, things that use computation to, <clears throat> to understand how the brain works. This is one of the pioneers of AI, Minsky from the 1960s, one of the pioneers of vision, uh, David Marr. And we'll look at some recent work, some important advances from this very year, from 2023. Uh, this one looks at electric fields and how they, they might be important, how neurons might be just um, really um, not very important. It's electric fields that could actually uh, be the building blocks of thought. So in conclusion, we, we've gone over a lot of topics quite rapidly there, but I wanted to show you what we'll be covering on the rest of the course. So, so don't worry if uh, any of that was um, <laughs> confusing. We're, we're not expecting you to be uh, familiar with, with any of this already. It's uh, very much a course aimed at complete beginners. So don't worry if uh, you haven't studied psychology or brain science or anything like that before. And overall, we'll, we'll conclude that cognitive science requires you to change your worldview just like physicists had to change their worldview when um, Einstein discovered relativity or when 
um, the Germans discovered quantum physics. Uh, psychologists and brain scientists have to change our worldview as well because cognitive science is telling us some quite surprising things. Um, so overall, we'll ask, could the brain be an engine? Could it be a computer? Is it working together like people in a company? Is it acting like a city? Or is it um, transducing energy like a hurricane or a flame does? All of our neurons, of course, are powered by uh, burning sugar. So they're powered by essentially flame. Okay, so we'll finish up there. Um, I'll stay around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions, but uh, we're at the end of our session now. So feel free to log off. Um, myself and Miriam will be in touch uh, very soon with some further details. And I look forward to seeing you on the rest of the course. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. And uh, I look forward to uh, your further questions at some point soon. Thank you all. Have a good evening. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. So if you do, uh, feel free to. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Have a good week, everyone. And a good weekend. Great. Hi there. I have a question. Um, I, yeah. I'm not sure if, if I will I will miss up because I, well, it is the first time that I realized that cognition 